Um, cool. So can we have a warm round of applause, please, to so welcome to the stage, Rosie Wilson. Excellent. Uh, yes, I am Rosie Wilby, and I am a comedian for my sins, and often perform at this very, very uh, venue. Uh, yeah, I'm also a podcaster and the author of a book, and uh, it's called The Breakup Monologues. Cheer if you've ever been dumped. Woo! Quite happy about it, yeah, yeah. Cheer if you've never been dumped, and you're the person who always does the dumping. Get out. Um, <laughs> And my interest in breakups all came about when a few years ago I got dumped by email. Oh, oh what do we think about that? Yeah, a bit rude, isn't it? But uh, I did feel much better about it once I had corrected her spelling. <laughs> and punctuation and changed the font. Breakup in wingdings is far preferable. Uh, but what's interesting is I do think that being dumped by email is probably quite quaint and polite when you think about it because now we have this whole era, don't we, of, of ghosting and all these behaviours, all these new terms that we have for just, you know, disappearing on somebody. And my favourite new term in the lexicon of breakups is marleying, which is where you do ghost somebody but then you pop up again at Christmas. <laughs> so... <laughs> As you can see, the subtitle of my book is The Unexpected Joy of Heartbreak, which, which perhaps sounds a bit peculiar. And I've really been into this idea that the end of a chapter is also the beginning of a new chapter of our lives. And once we have got through the really horrible, painful part, a breakup can be an opportunity for learning and healing and growth. And so I really talk about how... I have learnt from all my many past breakups how to finally settle down and stay in a relationship with girlfriend, she's called in the book. She's now my wife, so maybe I have actually learnt something. So uh, I'm going to read a little bit from the book that sort of speaks to this idea of breakups being transformative. We're driving to a festival in girlfriend's midlife crisis car, an electric blue BMW convertible. Although the way she drives makes me wonder if you can still describe it as a midlife crisis if it ends up killing us. That would be an end of life crisis and quite a crisis at that. Never mind, the sun is shining, our life is good. We have a fancy loft conversion. We go on ski holidays. We Google things like, can dog eat mange too? After two decades of scratching out a creative existence from gig to gig, first as a wistful indie songwriter and then as a willfully grassrootsy comedian, I now get to live like a wanker because my libido went all aspirational on me and drew me to a partner with an actual job. However, three months shy of our three-year anniversary, shit has got real. Girlfriend and I have reached a refreshing level of frankness about the fact that our mutual desire has waned. We've teetered and toppled over the parapet of honeymoon bliss and fallen to the ground below, stirred from the anaesthetising effects of the sexy brain chemicals that have propelled us along thus far with relative ease. Suddenly, we're acutely aware of the careers and friends we have neglected during the happy haze. We've reached a stage where being in a relationship with a fellow human has become a massive pain in the arse even though it's a largely excellent relationship that neither of us intends to leave. Repeat, we're not going to break up. Not for the foreseeable, not us. In fact, it's the first time I've reached this point and not been planning a daring, dramatic escape, counting up the significant partners, who I probably would have married if it had been legally available to me all along. I'm now on to my fifth wife. That puts me on a multi-marriage par with Joan Collins, already at the age of 48. She was 68 when she married her final husband. If I was going to continue to be a slave to serial monogamy, and if you're reading this, darling, of course I'm not, I would have ample time to overtake her and catch up with Liz Taylor and her seven husbands, one of whom she married twice. But I'm done with twisting. I think I'd like to stick. I found a funny, sexy, generous partner, even if she does have a ridiculous knobby car. Surely if I left this one... I'd be breaking up with love altogether. It would be my end game. And it's from this position of at least 
wanting to stay, of accepting the maddening claustrophobia of companionship, that I want to investigate why breakups continue to compel me so much. Perhaps it is because breakups facilitate and maybe even necessitate transformation. In the wake of a separation, our peers allow us to reinvent ourselves. The rest of the time, they like us to stay fixed so that they can move ahead and around us. But heartbreak is the golden ticket that circumvents this bullshit. Renewed and reborn, standing at the edge of the echoing canyon of our former frustrations, we shout, this is who I am now. And we run and skip away from the parched carcasses of the old selves we've grown to hate. For me, it's been during these fleeting, liberating gaps of singledom that I've really got shit done. I recorded and released an album. I launched a boutique music PR company. I started comedy. I wrote a book. Each time I harnessed any lingering feelings of anger, sadness and confusion and used them as energising forces for creativity, for moving forwards with new insights into my own shortcomings and foibles. I wonder if it's possible to do that much learning and actively stay in a relationship. I hope so. It must be right or else... All long-term couples would be codependent, emotionally stunted weirdos. <laughs> hmm. Hang on. So, <laughs> the breakup monologues actually uh, followed a previous comedy show that I toured, which was called Is Monogamy Dead?, which also became my first book. And this was inspired when I heard that in many surveys, around 50% of people confess to cheating. And that got me thinking, if you are in a monogamous relationship and you're not cheating, <laughs> you better look closely at your partner. Because simple math says it has got to be them. It's a bit of a worry, that, isn't it? A bit of a worry, that. Cheer if you are in relationships. Yeah, so th that was the same people who'd had breakups as well. So <laughs> it's all happening quickly. It's a roller coaster, guys. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, I love watching the body language between people who are together, especially if you see a couple and one of them is shorter than the other. I find myself fascinated and thinking, how did they get together? Did their eyes must meet across a seesaw? <laughs> And height difference is scientifically interesting because I don't even know, but men often go for a woman who's a bit shorter, women go for a man who's a bit taller, even that heterosexual relationships. But did you know in the gay world, these desires men and women have for a taller or shorter partner actually carry over? So it's quite hard for a short lesbian like me to catch you up. It's like tall les lesbian because she's looking for tall lesbian and that, and it carries on and on. And an endless spiral. And in some ways, it's quite good two gay people can't actually create a baby together because think about it runaway evolutionary theory would mean that lesbians would evolve and get taller and taller and taller and taller and taller gay men would get shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter until we could possibly all coexist in the same society could we it would be ridiculous people would be like oh the lesbians are coming run away <laughs> they're gonna crush us with their giant dr martin boots pick up that little teeny tiny gay man he can't run very fast with those tiny legs and so is Monogamy Dead uh, followed on from another comedy show that I toured around, which was called The Science of Sex and was a sort of spoofy history of sex research over the past few decades, including the work of these two, Masters and Johnson, who among many discoveries were the first people to tell us that for a woman to have an orgasm, a penis is not necessary. A discovery that I think she looks slightly happier about. <laughs> in that uh, particular photograph of them. So obviously, yeah, a lot of, lot of this stuff is a bit of fun and uh, jokes, but um, onto some uh, actual kind of facts and stats. Um, I decided, inspired by Kinsey and Masters and Johnson and all the great sex researchers, to do my own spot of sex research. And so I did a survey online looking at what kind of relationships people thought they were having on a sort of monogamy, polyamory spectrum. Um, because I had always been a serial monogamist on this kind of boom and bust roller coaster of the great high of falling in love, then it all goes around. And, uh, um, and we'll find out more about why maybe I was on that roller coaster in a bit. But um, I thought when I first heard about polyamory, that kind of sounded like a possible interesting alternative. Um, so the majority of people who responded to the survey did define as monogamous. Uh, what does it even mean? It comes from the Greek, monos gamos, meaning one marriage for life. Whereas we have adapted 
the meaning of that now, haven't we? To more of us mean sort of one marriage at a time. <laughs> uh, cheer if you're monogamous. <laughs> and uh, we also had some people responding to the survey who were polyamorous, having multiple ethically declared consensual relationships um, of, of many different forms and, and structures. And so it does obviously mean polyamory, many loves. And uh, what I particularly enjoy about the poly community is that they've started devising a whole new language to describe the different types of relationships that we can have. Because in our English language, we have this one word, love, which I feel is rather overburdened with lots of different types of meaning, lots of different types of love. And we just have this one word for all of them. I mean, I love chocolate and I love my wife. And one of those is an insatiable craving that never goes away. No. Uh, anyway, and so it's complicated, isn't it? And I was really refreshed when I found that my poly friends were all devising these new words. My favourite being that if you are poly and you've reached your threshold of partners, you can say that you're polysaturated. <laughs> Which is, uh, is nice, isn't it? So I also had some people respond to the survey who said that they were in an open relationship. Oh, I did, I should have asked, is anyone here polyamorous? No? Oh yeah, at the back, they're always at the back. They've always snuck in late because they're so busy. Um, <laughs> and there were also some people who were in an open relationship, a structure quite familiar to me because a number of my friends in the gay male community are in open relationships and, and make that really work well uh, because you can have a sort of primary partnership and maybe have some kind of freedom outside of that. In fact, we do see in many surveys gay men reporting the most sexual activity outside a primary partnership, but lesbians reporting the least. But the interesting thing about that is we also see lesbians having the highest rate of serial monogamy. If we look at these civil partnership dissolution rates from a few years ago, they were twice as high for lesbians as for gay men. Whereas now we have same-sex marriage, that ratio is, has increased. And now for every gay male couple that divorces, about four lesbian couples do. So it sort of turns some of our assumptions about sort of men and their, their sort of restless sexual appetites completely on their heads and maybe you know all of us find long-term monogamy now we live such long lives perhaps it's a challenge for all of us and that was really one of the messages for a book that i read when i was researching my comedy shows and two books and uh, this was a, a new york times journalist who'd written a book called what do women want because we do need a man to tell us <laughs> And these, uh, I think these cover photos are interesting as well, aren't they? Because I think that's um, a woman before and after filling in her uh, tax return. I think, <laughs> I think that's what that is, yes, yes. So I started to wonder if the, um, you know, the sort of monogamy that I had known, that I felt was this sort of cultural default in, in the Western world, in the way that we're supposed to have relationships, maybe it was just sort of loaded with secrecy and assumptions and there was a whole load of secrecy around around female desire, female sexuality, and that was being so heavily policed, you know, even though I had to some extent jumped out of the box and thought about having a different narrative by by coming out. I was still very tied to this idea of monogamy, even though I never talked about what that even meant. Um, so I decided to ask my server respondents what other secrets they kept from their partner. And my favorite one of those is the third one down. <laughs> Giving yourself the best portion of food. Who does that? Cheer now. <laughs> but I do think if you want to choose to be monogamous, and <laughs> I think you absolutely can actively choose monogamy if you know that other ways of having relationships exist and it's not the only sort of cultural default it's not the only way you need to answer the final question in my survey which was in a monogamous relationship what counts as infidelity and we're gonna we're gonna answer these questions uh, here in the room don't, don't worry you know all what happens in the room stays in the room um, we're gonna we're gonna have a show of hands uh, for 
for each of these and we'll see what my survey respondent said. So in a monogamous relationship, what counts as infidelity? Who thinks having sex with somebody else? <laughs> yeah, we seem fairly agreed on. I mean, it's still ambiguous, isn't it? What, what is having sex? I mean, we're not all Bill Clinton, are we? <laughs> and some people had written things in the comments, like, in a car. That person felt very strongly uh, about something there. And so 94% of my serious respondents said having sex with somebody else, however, they decided to find that, of course. And um, so then we, <laughs> we had kissing someone else, which, uh, yeah, that's interesting. Again, what kind of kiss? Where is it? Uh, how long does it last? Uh, I don't mean where is it in terms of in a car. I mean, anyway, I was thinking more where on the body. But... Uh, <laughs> Kissing somebody else. Uh, how many people would say kissing somebody else? Yeah, yeah, interesting. And uh, my favourite tip, actually, uh, in The Joy of Sex comes in the ch chapter about kissing. And it says, um, a good mouth-to-mouth -mouth kiss should leave its recipient breathless, but not asphyxiated. <laughs> Which is worth bearing in mind, isn't it? So, yeah, 76% of my survey respondents said that. Now then, it's interesting, because we get onto this more emotional spectrum of not so much what you or your partner do in the physical world, but what you feel, which perhaps is a lot harder to police. And we had falling in love with someone else without sexual contact. Who would say that would... Oh, there's someone, like, with a hand wrap waving there. And... Yeah, this wasn't far behind. This was 73% of people, so it was still a really popular answer. And then we had some behaviours that now come under the banner of sort of micro-cheating, uh, behaviours that are, that are facilitated by the new tech that we have at our fingertips and sort of text and email flirting, texting and flirting online. Who would think that would count as cheating? Oh, so less, less people for that one. Yes, yeah, 62% said that. And then we had a controversial one that's had some people chatting, staying up all night chatting, in fact. Um, staying up all night talking to someone. What do you think about that one? Oh, yes. You're like, oh, yes, yes, definitely. Um, and so that was 31%. And then I started to think, oh, come on. <laughs> Masturbating whilst thinking about someone else. Do does anyone think that's... Probably not going to own up to it here anyway, are we? <laughs> yes. Uh, so that was 14. And then we had just fantasising about somebody. Again, I don't know how you police this, really. What are you thinking about? Uh, how many people would say fantasising about somebody else? So 7% seven, seven of people said that. And then we had looking at porn alone. Did anyone think that? No, uh, but 4% of people... You see, sometimes people respond differently when they're on... The, what was interesting um, was I once had to do a sort of child-friendly version of this talk. <laughs> and, <laughs> it's challenging. At, um, at a wonderful event called Sunday Assembly. I think there are some friends uh, from Sunday Assembly here. And Sanderson Jones, who is, is one of the head honchos of some Sunday Assembly, had sort of carefully edited my slides. And so instead of looking at porn alone... He put, uh, looking at naughty pictures, sometimes moving. <laughs> I think everyone thought that it had like a moving story. Um, <laughs> which actually is the case with a lot of lesbian pawns, <laughs> um, to, to be fair. Um, but before um, I take questions, um, I just wanted to say, well, thank you so much. Uh, for listening to start, do keep in touch on Twitter and Instagram. And um, basically, I have sort of, um, you know, as, as have all of the speakers sort of given up um, this evening. I mean, I normally work in the evening and get paid for standing on stage talking shit. Um, <laughs> but I've, I've sort of given up this evening because I, I love Nerd Night and it's great. But it would be amazing if my lovely nerds, you might consider um, supporting my books, particularly the new book, The Breakup Monologues. Um, 
how about this for a lovely bit of nerdiness? You have a QR code um, that you can scan. Uh, would anyone check that, just to check that works? Um, and that will take you to the hardback or the... Uh, yeah, you're going to check. Brilliant. The hardback or the uh, Kindle or audiobook narrated uh, by me. But I have gone down the charts whilst there's been all the Queen's funeral and all that because I didn't feel like I could do all the hard sell and stuff. So um, even if you can't buy the book um, you know, tonight or anything, it really helps to um, go and pop it in your wish list or whatever, or save it for later, or even just send the link to a friend who has had a breakup and you think it might cheer them up, because there's a bit of fun, there's a bit of real science about breakups and how we get over it as well. And I also have um, a few physical copies that I could sign um, special messages in for people this evening and copies of the first book, which is now very rare and hard to get a hold of because it's sold out. Ooh, sold out everywhere except in my bedroom. <laughs> and I have some here tonight, so you don't have to come to my bedroom, and that's not compulsory. Uh, but no, it'd be great if you wanted to come and chat and maybe uh, get a couple of books. Um, I'm sure I can do a special deal if you want to buy both. Um, so thank you so much, and I hope to maybe have some fantastic questions. <laughs> Who has a question? Has anyone got a breakup dilemma or a sort of monogamy dilemma? I, there, there was once a woman who had like her two male partners with her and she was like having a great time and neither of them were happy with the situation at all. <laughs> it was re it's quite interesting. So, well, yeah, this is really interesting. Um, and I do think this varies across different social groups. And a lot of what I've investigated is how that varies across our sexual orientations. Because as I indicated, lesbians tend to have by far the highest rate of breakups. And it's very common within the lesbian community to sort of know all your exes because everyone's sort of interconnected in a weird sort of spidery diagram. And um, so you sort of have to end up getting on and doing a kind of conscious uncoupling, which I think we pioneered long before Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, and that, that sort of reflects this idea that women maybe have a, a more sort of restless romantic and sexual nature than we like to sort of admit in our patriarchal society um, so it's really interesting when we see male and male couples actually staying together the longest time of everybody and actually having the least breakups but perhaps having a sort of open and often very healthy attitude to sex outside a relationship which is definitely not for everybody I when I dip my toes into having an open relationship it's a disaster I went to the lesbian sauna for some casual sex and we all ended up just folding towels and tidying up <laughs> And when I did have a little snog with a woman under the shower, um, the shower was on a timer. <laughs> Just kept turning off. Uh, any, but anyway, my point is that there's, I think in our society there's a lot of awkwardness for women around sex. And it, anyway, it, there's, there's it's a lot of us... I, I also talk about in the book doing one of those sex lab experiments where you... Um, your, your genital arousal is being measured while you're looking at erotic images, which is also really fascinating because... Uh, for me, as with actually uh, many women who um, who sort of take part in these kind of experiments, is that um, our sexuality is really, really broad, however we define it. And so actually we sometimes want to label ourselves in these narrow ways, but our sexuality may be much, much, much broader than that. So I found that my arousal was sort of equal for images of men and women. And actually, I was quite turned on in the control clip as well, which was a David Attenborough documentary. <laughs> So it's, it's really interesting, and I, I do think um, it can, you know, I can meet gay women who've had 12 serious breakups, whereas a lot of my straight friends may have had sort of, you know, like two or three. So it does seem to vary a great deal, but there's also kind of obviously cultural um, differentiations as well. So really interesting, and I, I, I do think there's no real average. You're not doing it wrong if you've had 10 breakups. If, you, if you're friends with all those people, you're probably doing it really, really well. Oh, yes, yes. 
Um, maybe I should have repeated the first question, which was how many breakups um, do people typically have? Um, so what counts as infidelity, in my opinion? Um, I think it has to be negotiated with your partner, and it's a very subjective thing. So, uh, and I think it's constantly flu fluid and constantly moving. So, I think in each of the relationships I've had, what I define as infidelity is slightly defined by what my partner would call infidelity, as what her boundaries are, as well. Um, interestingly, one of the one of the experiences that taught me the most about boundaries was when I went and did comedy at a sex party, uh, which is <laughs> something else you can read about in the books. And uh, you had to sort of sign up to a charter of rules on entering the space, which was all about respecting one another's boundaries and um, having a sense of accountability about people's behaviour. And you can't enter the space without a pal who's going to kind of vouch for you and take you home if you're being a bit of a dick. So, and drinking loads and being aggressive or whatever. So, um, I think it's all defined by your own boundaries, and I, I do think it, it f is very fluid and in a state of flux and changes through through time, um, and even within the same relationship. But um, yeah, I think um, I think probably my definitions of it are looser than um, I think my wife would really find it difficult to forgive me for having sex with somebody else. But I honestly don't have time anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, whereas I think I would be if she wasn't in love with that person and it was like a sort of drunken one night stand I think I'm, I'm more relaxed about that because I think, I think people have desires and sometimes we act on them and it doesn't always mean you want to leave your relationship I think there's, we jump to assumptions too quickly about the fact that a relationship might be over if something happens with somebody else or we fancy somebody else and that kind of thing so um, yeah, I think these things are very fluid and we need to constantly discuss and negotiate them. Is there any more? One there. You talked about your book, Unexpected Joy of Heartbreak. What's the joy of heartbreak? Well, I sort of... Sorry, yes, yes. The Unexpected Joy of Heartbreak. What is the joy of heartbreak? Um, I kind of alluded to this at the beginning and I do think that a breakup is always a catalyst for change. And it is the beginning of a period of self-reflection. And maybe we actually make some really healthy changes. Maybe we do some positive creative work for me. That's when I've written books or written new shows. Um, and that's what I sort of mentioned in the reading that I, I, I did at the start. And it's very much, I think, a new page, a new chapter. And for that reason, I wrote the first half of the book backwards and the second half forwards to illustrate this idea that uh, the ending of something is always the beginning of something new. And I think it's good to try and hold on to that idea, however much we may feel we've lost the person, the one. And I think even if we are monogamous, taking a polyamorous view of breakups is quite healthy because within the poly community, it's common to not think of relationships being defined and valued by their duration. Whereas within monogamous culture, we have this sort of ascending hierarchy of wedding gifts. And you know, you go from lowly paper and wood to gold and sapphires and rubies. So uh, if you've been together years and years and years and you really hate each other, you've done really well. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think the joy is is in kind of having having that opportunity really to redefine yourself and and go off and use that time to start new relationships, start new careers, new projects, go travelling. And I've met all kinds of people who've done really thrilling and exciting things in the wake of a breakup. Was, Was there, there one one more? <laughs> How did I know it was the one, my current relationship and my past relationships? Um, I don't really believe in soulmates and the one. I believe there are lots of ones throughout our lives. And I, I do believe that we might have different ones throughout different stages of our lives because we now live so much longer than when you know, uh, evolution meant that we just sort of lived to give birth to our children, see them into the world, and then pop our clogs. Uh, you know, some of us, would, certainly I, would probably be dead by about now. Uh, <laughs> so I, I do think it's... Um, the, the idea of one life soulmate is, is stretching things a little bit now. Um, and I just think as I got older and as I'd done this work looking at relationships and thinking about them, yes, for the purposes of comedy, but also 
reflecting about my own life and relationships and choices and what I wanted. Um, I think we do feel once we've made some bad choices, we're better informed about what we do want because we know a bit about what we don't. And so I think there was just a really healthy communication and we were able to begin a healthier relationship. And there's actually a chapter in the book about how the quality of a relationship is rarely defined by the characteristics of the two individuals. It's often about the dynamic that you create with one another. It's about those shared memories and the jokes that you share together with one another. So again, humour can be really, really important. But it is about the relationship more than it is about the two people. So we're too caught up on the myth that we're looking for a specific person. We're not actually, we're looking for a relationship. Okay, well, okay, we'll be a bit quicker. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, do I address the idea of different types? of breakups in the way that we have different types of love. We also have different types of breakups. There is indeed a chapter in the book on friendship breakups, which people have responded to a great deal because we don't tend to have scripts or the same kind of social permissions for mourning those relationships. Um, we're not supposed to sit and eat ice cream and listen to Coldplay. I mean, I don't think you're supposed to do that anyway, but uh, <laughs> I believe some people do. Um, <laughs> so... Yeah, friendship breakups, also professional breakups and professional endings are something that I touch on as well because they're all endings and a type of loss that we do need to adjust to and, and recover from. Was there one last question? Yeah, yeah, I think um, our expectations, well, like you say, how much is um, a breakup because of what we expect from the relationship rather than what it is actually in the real present. Um, and I do think that, yeah, our expectations are hugely inflated by the romantic films and songs and, and all the imagery that we see on Valentine's cards and so on. And so we form an idea, a projection, of what our relationship will be long before we've even met our partner. We've got, we've got big checklists about, about what we want. How can anyone, how can any human actually, uh, maybe there'll be some kind of perfect robot or alien who will, we will be able to program in the future to meet our needs absolutely perfectly. But until we're just, you know, having to make do with fellow humans, we might have to be a bit more realistic. Um, I mean, I was once sent my ideal matches by a dating website, and it said um, even I was only a 73% match. <laughs> so what can we do? We're doomed. Uh, so yes, thank you for your questions. <laughs> to, uh, to keep in touch, and I hope to see you in the interview. If anyone would like to uh, buy a book, thank you so much. Would really appreciate that. Thank you.